for a while now, I've been set on season 8 of Death Battle being my favourite in the show's run, but that's down to how I interpret that question. I go with 8 because it has among the highest level of average quality, with the high points being the highest and the low points being relatively much better off than any other season's low points. If I was to go in with another criteria though, my answer could change. If it was the season with the highest quantity of amazing episodes, relative to the episode count at least, it would be season 9. If we meant the most overall consistent season with the fewest misfires, I'd say season 6 since that only has one episode I don't enjoy compared to all of the others having at least two. You see where I'm going with this, right? Season 10 is the best season of Death Battle, by a wide margin. I already thought seasons 8 and 9 raised the bar for this show, and then here we have the 2023 output shooting right over it. The overall quality of this season is staggering. For the first time, over half of the lineup is comprised of episodes I consider absolutely amazing. There's not a single bad episode among them. And my number one pick is straight up my new favourite episode that's released during the 13 years this show's been running. It doesn't feel real how well this all turned out. Especially when with no mid-season break to give the team some breathing room. Ben said on the cast that they ended up going a bit over budget this season, and that really shows on how the episodes turned out. I'll save my thanks and sentiments for the end. For now, let's just dive into ranking these 16 wonderful episodes. Those are some angry birds. Unsurprisingly, the bottom spot has not changed over time. Despite having arguably the season's strongest combatants, Phoenix vs Raven is still the season's weakest episodes. This one doesn't do much to capture my interest more than any of its competition. The analysis starts really strongly with the mythological Phoenix comparisons, and then only recaptures that same interest in a few short bursts here and there. The jokes weren't doing much for me, especially the cutaways, but I did actually really like the perfectly timed 16th death of Jean with the bagpipe music. Shout out to Scotland. And outside of a few bits of multiple panels covering the screen, the edit is really boring to me with all the full pages doing the same transitions over and over. The fight also lacks many memorable moments with a few really weird and awkward sequences, like Raven weaponizing these towers that she's trying to protect, this odd slow motion bit, the completely pointless Phoenix clones, and the weightless moon toss. I'm also a little let down by how few powers Jean gets to use outside of just fire, with the white Phoenix transformation being really underwhelming. Then her final attack disappears off screen and she just gets one shot while she has the home court advantage. A lot of stuff in this episode is either not very interesting or actively poorly conveyed. With all that said, I still kinda like it. While there are issues I can point out, there isn't anything about this episode I can call especially awful, and it has plenty of great stuff to balance it out. The obvious aspect is the visuals. The hand-drawn Soul Self and Phoenix Force looks so vibrant, far exceeding Raven vs Twilight in that regard. The pacing is also super well done, with both fighters drawing out each other's dark power and then purifying them with Raven's soul emerging from her own smouldering remains being a real highlight. The mansion segment's pretty well done, with the Afraid of the Dark line before Jean pushes back being especially cool. Forevermore works the X-Men and Teen Titans themes into a pretty fun song, though admittedly it does feel a bit more slanted towards the former. Corey Petit apparently wanted to voice Phoenix for a while, so it's cool that she finally got to, giving a solid performance alongside Kira Buckland doing the same with her reprisal of Raven. And for as anticlimactic as the ending is, it has some really striking imagery with Raven blowing out the last embers of what once was the Phoenix Force. It's an episode with a lot of great aspects to it, enough to outweigh how dull I find other parts of it, but not by such a huge margin that I can rank it any higher. I mean, this isn't even the best looking episode of the season anymore, not by a long shot, and a ton of the others have scripts that can match the presentation. Still, this being ranked last place should show what kind of lineup I'm working with here. Any other season would kill to not only have a fairly decent episode like this be the bottom of their barrel, but also for it to be this fairly clear cut. We can only go up from here, with just one more entry to go before we start getting into the really good stuff. I'm being carried by butterflies down the street. The season started small, fitting for a match like Ant-Man vs Atom. Yeah, this one still doesn't do all that much for me compared to the rest of the season. I don't think it has any major glaring issues. Like, I could point out Hank getting noticeably more moments to shine with his intelligence, while Raymond taking out the gun doesn't feel nearly as big since it hadn't amounted to anything before he destroyed it. But really, none of it's all that actively detrimental to the episodes. The only reason it ranks this low is by virtue of having the least about it I can say that I loved out of this entire season lineup. The fight is decently creative. I like how they play around with the set that the characters are shrunk on for some humorous visual gags, and later working around Atom's inability to grow by having the kaiju fight be on a microversal scale. The combat itself isn't all that interesting to me though. Not the hand to hand, even if I appreciate Atom's density control letting him stand his ground when Hank hits him, and not Atom's brief sword fight against the ant swarm, though I do appreciate the inclusion of it to switch things up a bit. The voice actors do alright with what they're given, but the dialogue isn't all that memorable to me. Well, I mean, outside of the line I gassed up for months 
response as if it gave one of my friends goosebumps. The big selling points of the fight to me are this awesome hand-drawn kill shot, which is possibly the most gruesome shot of the season, even if the energy explosion that follows it isn't all that interesting. And the 20-ish seconds of fight as one worked into the track, which was a shot in the arm for a song that worked well for what was required of it, but was easily the least interesting standalone bliss in this season. I say the analyses have more that stuck with me, really. I wouldn't say I was hooked on them or anything, and the pizza joke didn't work that well for me, but I did like a couple clever lines here and there, with Hank getting some good story coverage that tastefully handled the slap, and Atom getting some interesting displays of his intelligence brought up. This also has some of the season's best editing. DJ undoubtedly had the best debut in that regard that the show has ever seen, and I'd say that with the exception of Superman, these remained the best looking comic analyses all season. He did fantastic work bringing these comic panels to life with so little other footage to work with. No need to drag this one out much further. The feelings I get from this episode are not particularly strong, but they are mostly positive. I can watch this one and have a decent time, it just isn't one that plays particularly well into my own interests. So I'd imagine comic fans will get more out of it than me. And GA, of course, I mean, this is his favourite episode ever made. Rapper in disguise. So, this is where we go over Mansurfer and conclude the cape shit trifecta at the bottom, right? As much as I wish that was the case, Frieza vs Megatron's fallen off a bit over time for me. And even when I loved it after my first viewing, I didn't quite get the hype around it with how many tier lists I saw with this near the top. It definitely has some phenomenal elements to it, and I think it's a pretty good episode, a definite improvement over the two I just talked about, but it's also one of the more actively flawed packages this season, and the only one in the second half that I wouldn't say that I loved overall. Analyses are fairly solid. Freezes is held back a bit by how repetitive Dragon Ball rundowns can feel with the same power sets and feats being brought up every time, but this one did try and add some extra feats as window dressings to switch things up. And I just really like Frieza, so I quite liked hearing the coverage of him. And unlike with every piece of trivia in Gogeta vs Vegito, I actually learned something new about how Frieza's design was based on real estate agents. Megatron's was an interesting learning experience as well. Transformers hasn't had an episode in five years before this, so this was a welcome refresher for the series rather than feeling stale. Learning about Megatron's turn to the Autobots at the end was super interesting in particular. I don't think I'd heard of that before. I quite like the jokes here, with the only major exception being the constant toy robot comments in Megatron's rundown, and DJ did well with the edit. The fact he put out something on this level for the third of five episodes in a row he had to work on with no breathing room is insanely impressive. Some of that already being done by Nick in the years prior does not offset that at all. I don't see him getting nearly enough praise for how much he put into this season. The fight, meanwhile, got me hooked from the sneak preview. This was undoubtedly one of my favourite setups we'd gotten to this point in the year. Freeze's calm and collective yet still authoritative claiming a Cybertron was great, Megatron got an equally strong rebuttal, and the venom in Frieza's voice when he says he loves it when they monologue back remains one of the best vocal deliveries of the year. And the next line when he says he'll construct a new mothership from Megatron's corpse right as the music kicks in, god it's so good. I can only imagine how much better it'll get from here. You peaked. What? You peaked. Damn, that's a shame. I don't think the rest of it is bad at all, but I can't say it reaches the same heights as it did before. There is still a lot to love here though, like this is one of the season's best sounding episodes. The sound design is great and all, but it's the music and voice acting that really stand out to me. Final form is absolutely slaps, we're defeating the Decepticons with this one boys. The crew have said this was intended to be like a villainous reflection of Wings of Iron, and I can kinda see it. In fact, I don't know how popular of a take this is, but I actually like Final Form as a little bit better than Wings of Iron, I listen to it all the time. And as for the voice acting, my one hope with this episode was that they'd get Little Karibo to voice Frieza, which they did and I was so happy to hear his performance. I love him as Frieza in DPC Abridged, and it's no different here, selling almost all of the mannerisms amazingly whether Frieza's trying to sound classy or enraged beyond comprehension. Outside of the weird emphasis on the word die when he says Megatron will die by his hand, every delivery is up to the standard I was hoping for. So it says a lot that Tom Shulk still somehow managed to be my favourite performance in the episode as Megatron. The conviction and energy he brings to the role are fantastic, doing especially well with the ending speech and the My Planet scream. Everything looks great too, should go without saying. Apparently Devil Art misted the effect himself and the colours pop so well. This has got to be like the most purple death battle animation ever. And the fight has no shortage of cool and memorable moments, even past the setup. The melee and laser combat generally looks really good. I like when Megatron spins his mace to reflect the death beams. Tack Megatron's rocket jump in the 5 minutes reference were some really fun bits of levity. The scene of Frieza tossing Cybertron at Megatron to sandwich him between that and the death ball is awesome and builds on the previous large scale explosions. 
and Megatron's speech at the end as he summons the antimatter goes incredibly hard. Beyond what he actually says in the speech, I also love the idea of Megatron getting under Freeze's skin and taunting him to go into a stronger form than the one that he was already winning in, and then still getting to cause a near-fatal blow with the antimatter which takes out most of Freeze's body, showing that his wit does suffice to let him hold his own against this blithering putt's sheer power. I love a lot of what this fight does. It just unfortunately has some real glaring drawbacks that stop me from placing it any higher on the list. Let's start with the downside of the last thing that I mentioned. Frieza basically already winning while still in the golden form before he even goes black. I like the idea of this. It helps get around an issue Dragon Ball fights can have against opponents with no higher forms to ascend into. Either Frieza's lower forms are useless and he does nothing for most of the fight, or the power-ups don't feel like they matter. And it is good cohesion with the conclusion saying that Frieza only needs to go golden to have the stat advantage. The problem being, it doesn't go from Frieza losing to Frieza winning after the transformation. It goes from Frieza holding his own to Megatron getting absolutely throttled. A lot of this fight feels very Frieza-centric. He holds the advantage for most of it while still having more power in reserve, while Megatron doesn't get to do quite as much to make his own mark until the very end. Like, I would have loved for the panic bubble to be the centerpiece of a big part of the fight where Frieza can't outmaneuver him anymore. It's like they said in the analysis, he's not trapped in there with you, you're trapped in there with he already punched Frieza out of it before I could get through that sentence. The ending also has a lot of problems with it. The fake out doesn't work considering how the music isn't winding down and there was no shot they were killing Black Frieza before he could throw out a single attack. Even White Phoenix got to do more than that. And Megatron calls Frieza a fool. Three times. In a row. And it loses any oomph it had after the first one. I'm not fond of Frieza's line delivery here either. It's the only misfire that either VA had in the episode. Then the planet gets blown up with a death saucer, which is an odd choice, but alright. The last shot is cool at least. And the biggest problem I have with the fight overall, it just drags so many shots out unnecessarily while there isn't much happening that we need time to process and it really hurts the pacing. It's one of the longest fights this season, but I can't be as impressed with it as I am with, say, Vader vs. Obito. That episode managed to densely pack so much into its increased runtime that it felt like so much more got to happen. Even though Frieza vs. Megatron is longer, it feels like your average three and a bit minutes of content in an animation stretched out to four and a half. I don't know if this is controversial to say, but the worst case offender is the Golden Frieza transformation. Cool reference and all, but it did not need to go on for almost half a minute. That's time that could have been spent flashing out anything else. Like the panic bubble scene, which had more cut content in the storyboards. Actually, this is the episode that seems to have the most change between the storyboards and the final product from what I can tell. There are elements I wish they could have kept, but I understand that budget and time probably got in the way of that. Bringing up the boards isn't meant to be a criticism, by the way. I just thought it was interesting to note how much had changed. And I'd recommend checking them out on the artist's Twitter or DeviantArt, which I'll link in the description. As well as GA's video, where he goes more in-depth on all the changes that he noticed. This segment has gone on for way longer than I wanted, so let's wrap things up now. To summarise, this is an episode I like a good amount that just happens to have a lot more dragging it down than most, if not all of its competition. Also, people need to stop bugging Nem to watch it. I do not think there is anything he'd get out of the episode that would be enough to outweigh the negative associations he has with it. I'll be a living god! Martian Manhunter vs. Silver Surfer is a weird case where I liked the episode about as much as I expected to, but not in the way that I expected to. I thought it'd be a fun enough flying brick fight with a few cool tradings of abilities and minimal in the way of memorable character interactions. Instead, what we got was some of the most uneventful, uninteresting combat of the season with some really great and unique character writing. I love the film noir opening, with both characters assuming they were summoned by the other and not understanding why they're there. I kinda wish Surfer had any kind of reaction to Manhunter Hunter asking why out loud, but otherwise this is a really cool way to set an interesting tone that the fight unfortunately bails on immediately as it goes back to full colour until the very end. Said ending is also great, with the two realising they're both just as in the dark on the current situation as the other, and Manhunter coming to terms with the outcome, saying that he hopes Surfer can do the same before a really great monologue about how his victory came with no satisfaction. The climax and ending is also where the fight peaks in terms of how it looks and sounds, with Paul Guy it's mostly monotone Surfer performance getting to deliver just the right amount of sorrow as he says he doesn't know why they have to fight, Cameron Nakad settling some really intense grunts of pain after he'd already been doing a great job the rest of the fight, the track Mind Over Matter getting much more dramatic with the opera egg singing in the background, the bright backdrop and the effects conveying the sheer heat of the sun, and Manhunter getting an incredible hand-drawn death shot where you can see exactly when his struggle stops and he makes peace with going to see his family in the afterlife. 
This animation starts and ends so damn strongly. The pieces are there for one of their best Marvel vs DC episodes. So it's such a shame that the actual fighting is where this all sort of falls apart. Outside of the cool bit with the dragon, it's all just flight, lasers, phasing and very uneventful mental attacks and none of it's all that interesting. Again, besides the dragon, it peaks with a few perspective shots, the rotating shot and Surfer doing the funny game over pose. There's also this part where Manhunter throws some rocks and it was kind of difficult to tell at first which ones he affected and which ones were just floating normally through space. There isn't anything actively terrible to complain about with this animation, it just lacks much particularly memorable outside of the very start and end. It's a pretty good time overall and the same can be said for the analysis. I found their story coverage pretty interesting here with Manhunter's grief and Surfer's moral dilemmas that he found himself facing, all with what I'd call Parker's best edited solo project for the show. The comic panels feel much less static than they did in Phoenix vs Raven, and Boomstick's line about God knows how he can say the name backwards because I can barely say it forwards is one of my favourite jokes in the season, Chad's delivery is perfect. The conclusion unfortunately falls apart a bit. They don't really lock anything down for stats, so a lot of it is just lol power cosmic, with barely edited b-roll of mostly the fight that shows very few examples of anything. Shout out to when they talk about Surfer's regeneration and show him tanking an attack that does not cause any damage he'd need to regenerate from. Actually, I'm pretty sure they gave Manhunter more concretely multiversal stuff than Surfer, so this is the one case this season where the rundowns present information that make it look like the loser should have won. I know that's not how things were behind the scenes, I just don't think this script presented their research in the best of ways. Ant-Man vs Atom had a similar thing to a lesser extent, but that one at least had corner boxes giving actual arguments. This one doesn't have much there. If this one had a better conclusion and more interesting combat, I could totally see it climbing up higher. Still a good episode in its current state at least, but it's not hard to see why this is the most common pick for the weakest of the season in my friend group. All oh, this is true. Because it rhymes. It feels very wrong to have Galactus vs Unicron ranked this low down, but let me just clarify that I love every episode from this point onwards. This one is great, it just doesn't quite stack up next to some of the others. Analyses are very solid. Galactus is pretty funny, Unicron describes the terror he represents in a really engaging way and has one of the best endings this season, the editing looks great, I like the what is evil question present across both of them, it's really good stuff. There isn't much to say about the fight. It's not some big character piece with intricate choreography or anything. This fight's only goal is to deliver on as much spectacle as possible, and it does that with flying colours. The increase in scale from planetary to stellar to galactic proportions is awesome, with some of the best visual presentation I've ever seen in any web content, not just Death Battle. The effects and backgrounds are nothing short of mesmerising, arguably the best looking 3D Death Battle ever that I'm surprised their computers could even render without bursting into flames. I also kind of like the iambic pentameter rhyming gimmick that the dialogue has, even if it doesn't fit Unicron very well since he doesn't engage with conversation during battle ever really. I thought it could potentially fit the scenario of him fighting an equal, but Nem has told me since my review that that isn't the case, so that's a shame. I don't mind it that much though honestly since it's only a few lines. While he does get some decently cool ones of him coldly stating what he is and what he's doing. Ideally, we could have gotten something that plays to both of their strengths a bit more and shows the difference between them, having Galactus consume planets out of necessity to keep up with this cosmic force doing it just because he's that big of an asshole, which would have alleviated my problem of Galactus seeming to get completely random power boosts out of nowhere at several points. But like, the episode didn't need those character moments to be good. They definitely would have helped it when set against the competition which does have those, but this is clearly an episode writing almost entirely off of the scale and spectacle at all, which does carry it pretty high. In fact, that spectacle could have carried it a few spots higher even if I vastly prefer the choreography of the next couple I'm about to talk about, but man does it lose so much steam by the end. I don't have too much of a problem with most of Unicron's lines, but that finally I've won is probably the corniest, most ill-fitting line any character in this whole season got, to the point where he may as well have followed it up with, um, he's right behind me isn't he, when Galactus inevitably is fine because of course he is. They already set up that the nullifier is not a threat to him. This is the most obvious fake out in a season where one of the other episodes almost had it as a requirement for its script to function, and then Galactus just wins with no real reason for his sudden power up like they ran out of time and had to kill Unicron as quickly as possible. It is a disappointingly limp ending to an episode that was otherwise doing super 
super well. I think that's about the gist of what I have to say about this one, especially since the script was already way longer than I wanted, and my thoughts are still about the same as they were in my standalone review that I wrote barely a month before this segment. Bottom line is, this is a great episode with good music, voice acting, character analyses, and especially standout compositing work that I wish got to end in a stronger way than it did. For what it's worth, it shares the sentiment I have towards a lot of these episodes, where it wouldn't rank this low if it were in any other season list. The competition is just that stacked this year. He's right behind me, isn't he? Cole McGrath vs. Alex Mercer is quite the divisive episode among the community, with a lot of people putting it near the top of their rankings and were just super excited to see it happen at all, while others were disappointed in it enough to put it near the bottom, mainly because of the jokes and the analysis. And while I don't think finding an episode unfunny is an invalid criticism, I also don't think it should be enough to completely tank an episode if the rest of it is solid. The jokes are not the be-all end-all of an episode like this. With that said, the analysis in this episode is actively distractingly unfunny and really drags it down in my eyes. I do not like the bulk of the joke spawning from the 2013 script gimmick here. None of the excessive references or YouTube poop edits or whatever else are funny to me in a vacuum, but in context, they missed the mark completely to what the humor of that era of Death Battle was like. I mean, this was the year they gave us Ivy vs. Orchid, so it could have been worse, but it also gave us He-Man vs. Lionel, which I would argue is still one of the funniest episodes to this day. The presentation with it still including modern day calcs and cutaway gags makes this feel like just a season 10 analysis actively trying to be unfunny, missing the mark on the charm of those old seasons in a way that unintentionally ends up feeling really mean spirited. And unintentionally is the key word there. I know for a fact that that is not how the team wanted it to come across, but at the same time, I don't know who they thought this gimmick was going to make happy. I mean, they replaced the connections at the start with, okay, fine, you guys voted for it, so I guess we'll do it, even though these characters are irrelevant. Here's a script we fished out of the bin. I don't think the analyses are devoid of worth, obviously. There are still a handful of funny and charming lines like the E equals MC squared bit, and while Cole's cutaway did not work for me at all, I really hate, oh, who wrote this kinds of jokes. The Alex one was stupid in a way that I actually enjoyed. They also included the yearly that right boomstick, which was the highlight of the entire season. And they had the old let's end this debate once and for all interlude, which made me very happy. Both also got some decently interesting story coverage. Cole's was a little too late to save his otherwise not great analysis where the reference humor actively got in the way of discussing his powers, but Alex's was a lot more interesting to me with far fewer instances of reference humor to distract from it. All in all, I'd say Alex got a pretty good analysis actually. It's mainly Cole's that got a lot of the garbage front loaded into it, which drags it down quite a bit. I've never heard anyone complain about the fight though, and that's no surprise. I love the dynamic of Alex tearing everything up and not worrying about collateral, while Cole is trying to take him out to save the city. Alex gets to start out using abilities primarily made for 1v1 combat, and then later on starts using stronger abilities for larger crowds once he consumes more biomass, which apparently reflects how his powers progress across both prototype games, so that's pretty cool. I love the rail grinding segment at the start, Cole spinning around Alex's neck with the amp while he's frozen in place and then tossing him, and Alex lurking in the shadows as he regenerates is one of the most effective horror moments in the show in spite of the cheesy dialogue. That comment on the dialogue isn't a complaint by the way. While the gimmick and the analysis lost me completely, I actually do think a lot of the cheesy lines in the fight work to the episode's favour, feeling a lot more authentic to the kinds of edgy dialogue that would be written in the early 2010s. Paul Guy and Kevin Andrew Rivera deliver them all perfectly. I also love the track for this one. Inhuman is straight up fire. I don't know if it's what the music in these games is like, but it fits the vibe of this battle incredibly well. I mean, there's one bit near the start where it's still building up after the action had started and it doesn't fit as well, but then when it fully gets going after Alex does the big tendril burst, it's all smooth sailing. I especially love how it complements the ending, picking back up when Cole channels electricity through the radio tower and blasts Alex back, who then creates his armor to make it way more difficult for Cole to put a dent in him. I love when Cole charges at Alex, who stops himself from getting pushed back, bear hugs Cole, and then just leaps into the sky. And this shot of him preparing to stab him is getting printed out and going straight on my wall. Holy shit. The kill is neat too, and I like Cole's closing line. The conclusion was also pretty solid. In the way of complaints, uh, Cole stands like a lemon when Alex is charging at him here for some reason. I also kinda wish that Cole got to actively be saving people to better show him building his good karma, like have him help some people escape this building or make sure the helicopters land safely. I don't know, it's not too major, and I get that they probably didn't have the time for it with how difficult Alex's tendrils were to get right apparently. This is just a solid as hell fight with creative choreography, fun dialogue exchanges, plenty of cool standout moments, and good 
progression as they move around the city and continue to get higher up before dropping all the way back down to ground level at the end. Now, that last bit reminds me of another electricity fight this season. I really wish the analysis didn't actively shoot itself in the foot so I could rank this one higher, but as is, it's still pretty great. Or at least it would have been if Alex got to use Pack Leader, but he didn't, so the episode is shit actually. Kiwa, I'm scared. While I understand why, it's a bit of a shame that Kilo vs. Misaka got completely buried amongst the rest of the season. I think it's a really solid episode, serving as an interesting way to introduce me to two series that are way too long for me to want to get into anytime soon, but I enjoyed learning about them. I like how Kilo was started talking about his assassination training, then how his life improved because of his friends, before he eventually set off on his own, and I was interested in learning about Misaka's dead clones and how her powerless crush was able to put her in a better headspace. There are solid jokes throughout, minus the Kilo name pun which got old and much than I remember, and I like that Wiz got to get excited over the weaponry and power systems this time. They fit quite well for him. The editing was stellar as well. DJ knocked this one out of the park with a ton of really vibrant effects and motion graphics, even for as little as the character's renders in the intro. I didn't even notice until it was pointed out to me that Killua's rundown starts with the photo of him and his family with their faces obscured, and then ends with a photo of him happy with his friends. That's such nice attention to detail. The fight's also really great. It does take some time to fully get going, and I kinda wish the rhythm echo got to dim the background lighting like I've seen for it in other clips to make it look less boring, but after that it's all systems go. This fight has a really cool dynamic, focusing on the two strategizing to take the other out. They both know that Killua has the melee advantage while Misaka's better at a range, so they try to control the distance between the two to give themselves the advantage. Killua is taking every opportunity he can to get close, while Misaka's using every trick she can to keep him at a distance and still enough to land the one shot she needs to end things. But even when seemingly restrained, Killua still finds ways to find his footing and keep himself in the fight. As the fight rises in intensity, it also does so physically as the characters are constantly getting higher and higher, culminating in Killua rising one last time and going for the kill, only to be tricked as he falls back to ground level and Misaka is finally able to land the killing railgun shot. There are so many dynamic camera angles and cool interactions of powers in this, it's a blast. I also quite like the voice acting, primarily on Killua's end. Finti Kelly Lowe was alright as Misaka, sounding focused and calculating when needed, but Giselle Fernandez as Killua stole the show for me here. They got to show off more of a noticeable range of emotions. I found a lot more entertainment in how characterful Killua was, starting out as a cocky little shit and then putting more and more effort into everything, peaking with the it can be disrupted line. On top of that, Killua's custom sprites looked really good and had some great rigging done. Misaka had her moments there too, but generally had some more stiff and boring poses that made it seem like that style of sprites just wasn't designed to be rigged like this. Thankfully, the hand-drawn Iron Sand Kaiju more than made up for it, especially with how it set such a cool first impression for its entrance, making the city's lights flicker. The background looks fantastic, Change of Heart is a very energetic and exciting song to accompany everything, and the conclusion is very solidly put together, tackling direct feats and downscaling, as well as strategy given how important that is to the outcomes of fights in both of these two's worlds. Not much else to say, except how I got Psyche K, Bochy the Rock, and Lab Rats footage all almost in a row in Misaka's analysis. Best episode of the season free, let's go. Imaginary technique. Purple. I can't think of any episode that was simultaneously perfectly and unfortunately timed quite like Gojo vs Makama. Unfortunately, because spoilery reasons that they didn't have time to work into the script, big fan of Among Us, and perfectly timed because the episode popped off in terms of views. At the time of this recording, it is still in the lead by a good 3, 400,000 over Goku vs Superman, and is the first one since Omnilander to hit 4 million views. And that's deserved because this is a banger. Putting this in the bottom half hurts me, especially with how close it was between this and my number 8 pick. I love the analysis as a casual fan of both series. I already saw and loved season 1 of Chainsaw Man. Makama really interested me as an antagonist and the anime has kept very secretive on her powers so far, so hearing about the manga stuff that I haven't read ahead for was super interesting, and I actually checked out Jujutsu Kaisen season 1 after this episode, fully intending to check the rest of it out at some point. I really love it so far, with Gojo being my favourite character in it, and one of my favourite combatants in general this season. I love his analysis as well, same with Makama's. I feel like it covered a good balance of story and versus stuff. Makama admittedly got a more conclusive end for obvious reasons. I thought the jokes were really strong, I liked Wiz geeking out over Curse Mask and the Gojo cutaway, the editing for Parker and Eiji was incredible, one of my favourite details being how the colour of the text highlights match the colour of the character's eyes in the respective analysis. It's an amazing pair of rundowns. Really the only thing I can point to that fell flat to me was the Makama cutaway. Not even because the joke was bad in a vacuum, I just don't think it benefited from being a cutaway. This feels like the tamest shit ever for Boomstick to be backing away in fear of. Before 
we get to the fight, they also specified the unique rules, which was a welcome surprise. Saying that they'd be citizens of the same Japan actually made me second guess into thinking Makuma was gonna win. The setup to this fight is perhaps the funniest one we've ever gotten. Gojo is so fucking obnoxious, and I love him for it. Stealing Makuma's popcorn, talking over the film, laughing as loudly as possible while pointing at the screen, but not losing his intimidating edge by casually dropping that he knows Makuma's a curse and that he's here to kill her, which is what finally gets her attention as she slowly glances over to him as the music starts building up. It's given all the breathing room it needs, it fits the characters perfectly in tone and setting, there's a Jack vs. Afro callback, all the season's 3D losers are in the back row, no notes on how this fight starts. It's perfect and more than worth having to shorten the rest of the fight for. Then once it actually gets going, the combat is all really cool. Gojo gets to use all of his main curse techniques in the battle, and while Makam is only able to use a few devils, that's kind of a concession that has to be made. Most of Makuma's entire arsenal comes from different beings with no existing sprite assets, so she was going against the episode's budget from the beginning. The few she does get to use are still cool. The wolf devil gets a really cool hand-drawn shot, and the rest are all cloaked in shadows. Obviously a trick to save the budget, but it's a cool effect that made them look more menacing at least. There are a ton of memorably cool and funny moments that come from the clashing of their polar opposite personalities. Also this bit where they blow up the guy taking a shit which is golden, and I love how everything is turned on its head at the end. Throughout the fight, Gojo had been a cocky little bastard, well aware that Limitless can stop all of Makuma's offense in its tracks, and that's reflected in how playful and carefree a lot of his lines are. This might actually be my favorite Gianni Matragano performance on the show, so the impact of when Makuma is finally able to get past it with Bang and catch him off guard is really felt, especially since they give the moment all the time it needs to set in. Then Makuma, who Kelsey Jaffer had been portraying very well as the cold, stoic monster she is, finally gets to let loose with her now infamous laughter as the already good custom track peaks with their wolf going ham on the guitar. I know this is a point of controversy since Makuma's similar laughs in canon had a lot more build up than the two minutes of combat up until now could allow for. Obviously this was never going to mean as much as it did in her story, however I wouldn't say this is out of character as far as I can tell, since even though Chainsaw Man naturally had more time to build it up, Makuma gleefully laughing as she brings down someone she couldn't control before is in line with her canon actions. This isn't coming from first hand experience, but plenty of my friends who have read Chainsaw Man have given me their own input and I trust them enough with the context of what they've shown me. And we haven't heard Makuma's laugh adapted into the anime yet, so we have no frame of reference for if this is more intense and expressive than what would be in character for her. I think the bit where she's shooting Gojo apart is fine, though with that said I would have personally dialed the second one back a bit. A more subdued laugh may have fit the scene better. Another concession that kinda has to be made towards the end is that with Gojo winning, there had to be an obvious fake out. He hadn't used Domain Expansion or Hollow Purple yet, which had to be saved for the end and there was no way they were going to kill him without letting him at least attempt them, so that made his victory kind of obvious. Though it is preferable to the alternate outcome of Makama getting literally zero significant moments of advantage as Gojo walls everything out with Limitless, and Makama using Bang earlier would have completely removed the impact of when she does finally land a hit, as well as having her know that the rest of her arsenal is irrelevant. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. It's still a cool ending at the very least. The regeneration and domain expansion is probably my favourite hand-drawn shot in Gojo line in an animation that has a lot of competition for both categories. I love all the hidden references as Unlimited Void overwhelms Makuma, and Hollow Purple is made to feel just as overwhelming as it engulfs her and reduces her to nothing. Makuma screaming is another point of contention from what I hear, and I do agree that the intent of the scream being internal isn't conveyed super well, but it's preferable to having her not react at all in my opinion. I think it helps to sell how she's being mentally fried with a kind of attack that she's never had to face before. I love the conclusion as well, it's easily one of the season's best. The stats discussion is summarized fairly quickly so that they can get into all the Gojo's counters and win cons. It's such a lengthy and in-depth discussion that held my interest more than any other one has in a while. It's an amazing way to close out an already amazing episode. One that has concessions that you have to make with it because of how one character is actively unfriendly to the show's budget and the other is actively unfriendly to their writing style, but ultimately turned out as a spectacular showing despite that uphill battle. Really about all I can complain about besides any of that is the slow throwing of zombies at the start and Gojo's you're so weak line standing out as kinda tryhardy when he'd otherwise been making his charisma in the fight feel effortless. Any problems I have are small fries next to what this episode gets right. Just about everything is on point and I'm glad it got to introduce me to a character I love as much as the fraudulent one. My first girlfriend turned into the moon. Well, that's a huge bummer. Chosen Undead vs Dragonborn is ranking a lot lower than I expected it to when it first dropped back in June. Now is that because my opinion of it is worsening, or the competition is just that stacked? Honestly, it's a little bit of both. 
The cracks in this one have begun to stuck out more to me over time. I still don't like the weird pauses for sound effects in the analysis, the abundance of music cuts for the jokes, some attempts at levity clashing with the tone of the undeads analysis, the unfunny way the end the dragonborn analysis, the goofy way the dragonborn model looks in a few shots, or the really pathetic way the first flame does nothing and then gets extinguished with a sneeze. And with how strong the rest of the episodes this season, those flaws do bring it down quite a bit in the ranking for me. It's still an amazing episode though, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Everything I didn't just mention is either a flaw not significant enough to bring up, or I love it. The analyses are fantastic, with the Dovahkiins having plenty of banger jokes and edits, while the Undeads has such a gripping coverage of Dark Souls lore with a somber tone that really stands out. I especially love how the Undeads analysis ends talking in the second person, which is then how the Dragonborn starts. That is great cohesion. The fight is fantastic as well, featuring some of the best lighting the show has to offer and tons of exciting combat with varied weaponry and magic and references aplenty, some of which I picked up on and some of which I needed the comments to point out for me because I am clueless with these series. Even the references I did notice weren't shoehorned at all. Like, of course you have to have the undead roll out of the way of attacks. And it's a super funny sequence. And the arrow to the knee bit was worked in about as naturally as you were ever gonna get it. I kinda wish that more than three total arrows got fired during the sequence or that they were spaced out better than being rapid fire and then stopping for no reason, but at that point we're getting into nitpicking territory so let's not. The setup works incredibly well, with Kath sending the Dovahkiin to take out the first flame while Fram gets the undead to defend it. Not only playing into the choices that the players of both games have the morality and allegiances, but also playing out similarly to some cut content from Dark Souls, which is a really cool deep cut. The way the undead keeps dying and coming back, trying new strategies each time is such a compelling dynamic for the fight, with each death feeling distinct enough from what preceded it. The dragon summon is awesome and I love that the undead takes it out with her dragon killing bow. I love the undead catching the Dovahkiin's lightning strikes and still getting matched with it evenly, leading to this amazing shot of them both briefly down and recovering. The final sword clash is cool as hell. The vow of silence is awesome and I love how the chosen undead pushes through their impalement to choke the dragonborn out, but in a moment of hubris accidentally reveals that the spell had worn off which leads to the dragon worm retaliating with unrelenting force. And outside of the pitiful first flame fumble, the lead up with it engulfing everything and the implication of the aftermath are really sick. All of it is underscored with one of the greatest tracks the show has ever seen. Fireborn is phenomenal in every sense of the word, with fantastic work from the fan choir and such a grand feeling instrumental adding to the feeling that this battle is being recounted from generations ago. My favourite part is how it crescendos when they're readying their sun and moon blades, somehow making the preparation for the final clash more intense and memorable to me than the final clash itself. One of my friends was also in this despite not being involved with the death battle community and that's really cool. I know she was really excited to be singing about the Dovahkiin, Dovahkiin. Skyrim's like her favourite thing ever, she must have been ecstatic. What else can be said about this episode? It's a prime example of Liam knowing exactly how to execute his passion projects in a way that makes the love for the series painfully evident. The analysis is compelling, the fight kicks all kinds of ass with great action, comedy and hype moments, the conclusion makes a solid case for the verdict with both game mechanics and lore discussed separately, it was pretty much all executed phenomenally with only a few hiccups across the roads. It also made me a big fan of Foos, love that guy. It's, it's cool Rick, I'm Doctor Who in this mother Rick from Morty vs Doctor Who is only improved over time for me, shooting up an extra two spots on the list on this rewatch. It's far from the craziest episode in terms of its combat, but man it just puts such a big smile on my face from beginning to end. The analyses are still some of my favourites released this year. I dig their similar structure in bringing up their partners first, how they met, dropping the series titles, then discussing their wacky gadgets and adventures, the sadder parts of their stories and the similar enemies that they fought, all with a ton of really entertaining jokes including the cutaways which I enjoyed a good amount, and Max making a very strong first impression with his debut to editing a whole episode on his own. I'm very glad he got to work on one of his most wanted matches. Doctor's rundown is a fair bit longer than Rick's, but I think that's justified with how much more material they had to cover and how it was so well paced that I didn't notice at any point. There's not much more to complain about when getting into the animation. It's one that excels with its character work rather than its action, having so many fun interactions between them. Rick is naturally much more aggressive, directly insulting and threatening the Doctor more, wrecking the inside of the TARDIS when he has the chance and actively using more weapons. While the Doctor is only defending themselves and fleeing for most of the fight, never once throwing an attack that isn't solely intended to disarm Rick, and hesitating to use his only lethal weapon in the animation which he never even ends up 
up touching. Even when it comes time for the killing blow, he sets it up so that Rick ends up taking himself out with the DMAT gun. With how badly some pacifists have been treated in previous seasons, this is such a refreshing take that works around the Doctor's reluctance to kill perfectly. Ben has described the progression of this as a Rick and Marty episode that gets taken over by the Doctor, and I can definitely see that. We start following Rick as he chases the Doctor down, and go through more distinctly Rick and Marty themed locations like the Fortnite planet with the screaming sun and blips and chits with all the fun cameos, to the Weeping Angels dimension, and then inside the TARDIS. I love how much variety there is in this fight set pieces. I think it all goes without saying that I also love the look and sound of it all. That's not the first time I've given that praise in this video, and spoilers, but I will also be bringing it up for every single thing ranked above it. This is the season's in-house hand-run episode, and it looks so damn good. Rick is plucked almost straight from his series, with the slight proportion changes actually working better for me than in his source material, and Doctor is adapted flawlessly into this style from live action. They both look great, as does every single aspect of the many 3D backgrounds. The cameos especially in the arcade help to give it so much more life, while making them fun references rather than faceless background NPCs. Wabalaba Alonzi is a stellar instrumental track, with the sci-fi sounds giving this one a really unique feel compared to most other episodes. Brent Williams gives an alright performance as Rick. While I definitely didn't click with a few of the deliveries, the end to the monologue in particular, which also just doesn't sound like something Rick would say to a stranger in general, I think there are enough good deliveries to balance it out, like the opening, the snappy comeback when he pulls out the sword, and especially the Wubba Lubba Dub Dub at the end, which I feel bad about not mentioning in my original review because it's my favourite line delivery of Rick's in the fight. Elliot Crossley steals the show here though, which is natural given his status as a David Tennant impersonator for official Doctor Who material. Every single one of his lines is perfectly cheeky, charming, and charismatic, and he gets plenty of fun nods to quotes from his series. Even smaller bits like the noise he makes when smirking at the smiling sun to show his appreciation of all life is just incredible. He also gets one of the greatest reworkings of a reference line in any death battle, turning the I don't want to go line from something he says when fearing his regeneration to a bold declaration that their refusal to die is the reason that Rick can't beat them, before regenerating with explosive force as the music swells. Genuine chills. I adore this episode so damn much. It's got great, exciting action, focusing a good amount on the battle of wits between the characters trying to outsmart each other, while working in a good amount of Rick's gadgets, even if most of them are a bit more on the basic side compared to more of the unique and interesting ones he could have used. And it using less for the Doctor is actually fitting, playing into how characterful every aspect of this episode is. The analysis is compelling, the conclusion is super lengthy and thorough. I can't really say there's much about it that doesn't work for me beyond the minor gripes that I already mentioned. Meanwhile, there's a lot more to praise that I just don't don't have the time to in this short ranking segment. If you want to hear from a more experienced fan of Doctor Who though, my friend Ollie joined me when I did the solo review for this episode and she was able to provide a lot more insight into a lot of the callbacks and characterizations for Doctor's end of things. Definitely go check that out if you want to hear a perspective of someone who has this as her favourite episode of all time. It might not quite be there for me, but it is still undoubtedly fantastic. You're not good. You're super. Finally. You guys have no idea how much I've been dying to talk about Goku vs Superman after I didn't have the time to make a standalone review in December. I actually rewatched the other two episodes alongside this one. I've said before that the first is one of my favourite death battles of all time, which still held true on this rewatch. I've also said a few times that, in spite of its issues, I still consider the sequel to be a good episode. I made a mistake. Let me just uh, fix. Okay, there we go. As for this third go around, I wasn't sold from its announcement or Goku's analysis preview. But then Superman's really caught my attention, and the passion that Ben and his team were showing for it got me fully on board. And luckily, we ended up getting something much closer to the first in terms of how much I love it than the second. So let's take it piece by piece. Goku's analysis took a while to grow on me, but I do really like it. It might not be a favorite of mine this season, just due to how, as much as I like Goku, I wasn't all that interested in seeing him. Get covered again, but they still managed to provide a fun coverage of his training powers and his drive and determination which makes him such a compelling character at his best. The cutaway was also super charming and the editing was top tier, with all the best motion graphics being safer after the previews. It's the easy weakest link of the four segments of the episode and yet it's still really damn solid. I think I still prefer the original one, but the new one at the very least doesn't completely neglect to bring up any feats until the conclusion, so that's nice. And what do you know, they re-examine the universe shockwaves and cut down how much time they spend just describing it so it doesn't go on for too long, finally breathing some new life into this same tired feet that's been coughing up dust for three years. 
And Superman's analysis is easily my favourite of the three, uh, two and a half that he's gotten. It feels like it understands his character the best, seeing how no act of heroism is too small for him to care about even in spite of his absurd power. It impressively manages to condense so many errors of this character into a digestible analysis that feels like it pays respect to all of them. From the wackier powers to the absurd feats, it feels like they all get their dues. I like the jokes and edits in this one as well. The animation on that super flare is just holy shit chef's kiss easily my second favourite edit of the episode, with number one of course being the Ultraman my favourite panel when they mention the brownie feet. It took that top spot by default, that panel still sends me every time I see it. Now the fight. I'll be honest, there isn't much to say about most of it. It's very simplistic fun action that gets across the speed of the characters very well while still knowing when to slow down for fun character interactions. Actually speaking of the character interactions, I do enjoy the vibe between the two here better than in the original. I don't have a problem with Superman being a bit aggro in the first one since it makes sense in the context of Goku picking a fight out of nowhere, but I do generally prefer the two being on good terms and having a friendly spar, even if they have to sacrifice more of a setup for it. Goku is actively trying to draw out Superman's full strength so that Clark can enjoy the fight as much as he is, while Superman is just humouring him but does eventually come around to having some fun as well when he knows that everything can be wished back. I love every single line that both of them get in the fight. Should also go without saying that this is the best looking Goku vs Superman on the Death Battle channel. Fighters Goku looks great, I like the edited Fortnite model for Superman, the effects and environmental destruction are all beautiful, the expression work is arguably the best in any 3D episode, it's just a treat for the eyes. And I even like the new voices about the same as the old ones. As much as I love Masako and just some random guy, Michael Kovac and Xander Mobus prove why they're some of the best actors Death Battle has ever hired. Coming across as very friendly to each other while still putting a lot of oomph into the grunts and battle cries. As for what happens in it, um, I like the fighter's reference, the snappy animation in this shot is very satisfying to me, uh, the Super Saiyan Blue transformation is pretty cool, and the following Kamehameha, well probably the least interesting part of the fight, is still alright. The one inch punch was sick, Goku missing all these key blasts is a bit weird, but I like Superman accidentally breaking the moon when he gets carried away, and then Goku's calm response indicating to him that he can freely go all out. I love how quickly he destroys Super Saiyan Blue Goku, and his punches cracking reality is a great touch, the cameos from the previous actors were delightful to hear, the nice suit interaction was super charming, and I like Superman not flinching at base Goku attacking him before he's finally able to ring out Ultra Instinct. Said form easily gets my preferred of Goku's two transformations in this episode, leveling the playing field as he counters the obligatory Man of Steel reference and matches Clark blow for blow at blinding speeds before landing more hits forcing out the super flare, demonstrating that he's finally putting Superman on the back foot after doing his first sign of visible damage to his cape. The split second rock paper scissors match is a very funny easter egg as well that shows how much love and care was put into all of this. And yeah, that's the bulk of the episode right there. Not really much for me to comment on. As enjoyable as it is, it's all very simplistic. And I don't know if this will be controversial to say, but I prefer the original as an overall package. That's not because this one has any glaring flaws, I think they both do what they set out to do pretty much perfectly, I just personally prefer what the original sets out to do. The longer length of the fight allows them to do a lot more showing off a greater array of powers, having Goku gradually build up through his forms more and more, getting to have more varied tones in different scenes thanks to the different music tracks, the feeling of blistering speed still hasn't been talked by any other animation since its release, and the overall episode feels a lot grander thanks to the different intro with the synthetic orchestra playing instead of Invader. While one definitely has more noticeable flaws thanks to its age, I can ignore pretty much all of them as any of its crusty imperfections only add to the season 1 charm of it all. 3 is a lot more basic with its choreography. And while it's really good all the way through, it doesn't quite hit the beats that I would want to call it an all-time favourite for the bulk of the fight. That's not to say it doesn't have its advantages, of course. The production value is just objectively higher, that should go without saying. It has all the benefits of modern assets and the ability to make the animation and analyses look way better. The mic quality on the voice actors is better. I prefer the friendly dynamic between the characters here, even if the original does have some comparably fun interactions. All stuff I've mentioned prior. What you may notice that I haven't mentioned, though, is the end. Ending. The first has one of my favourites in all of Death Battle, and somehow they still manage to top it. After the Super Flare uses up most of his energy, Clark darts off into space to gather the energy of all the stars that he can fly through as we cut to this wide shot of the galaxy, which looks stunning as Superman lights up with each star that he flies through, and Goku just lets it happen in service of fighting his foe at his best, his smile returning to him for the first time since entering Ultra Instinct since now he knows that he's pushed Superman into giving it everything that 
he has. He charges up a Kamehameha as Superman is sun dipping, hearkening back to their first episodes, and they even call back to the second in a way that made me so happy. Few things this season made my face light up as much as the song dropping the line, Watch Me Come Alive, as Superman charges forward for their final clash. It'd be a crime for me to not mention the music, actually. I've been saving that for now. My least favourite segment of it is during the initial Ultra Instinct scuffle, which is a part that goes hard as hell nonetheless and blows most other custom tracks out of the water. This song is pretty much perfect to me. High energy in its instrumentals and vocals, with the general rocking sound of Dragon Ball music while having some Superman sounding motifs in there to not make it too one-sided. And some of the lyrics being sung from the perspective of Goku to Superman explaining how much he loves the heat of battle is some of the best writing in any death battle track. I also adore the lead up to the final clash. It builds in intensity flawlessly, and it's responsible for me waking up to like five different in this moment DMs. Thanks guys, I hate you all. Lovingly, of course. The final section suits the final clash perfectly. My one problem with Dragon Dance last season was that it didn't really pick up in intensity that much, delivering on the same energy for the climax as it did for the very beginning. Super does exactly that, feeling much more climactic in its final chorus, contributing to what I consider to be the single most exciting climax in death battle history. Not my overall favourite, there are others with better kills, dialogue exchanges, tension building, story beats and so on, but in terms of sheer hype and adrenaline, this is unmatched. Michael Kovac giving the best Kamehameha scream in the show, Superman cutting through the beam with his heat vision, Kovac then outdoing his previous delivery with a Kaioken scream sounding like he's putting everything into it, the burst in power blowing up the planet with its recoil, the beam now engulfing Superman who has to put his all into one last punch, Goku's body giving out completely due to the toll of Ultra Instinct and Kaioken stacked on top of each other, so the key avatar has to send out his own final punch, and their last clash destroying all of reality. It's fucking perfect in every sense of the word. It astounds me that a sequence can be this visually busy and yet have everything be coherent thanks to the distinct colour palette for both characters' attacks and bodies. One of the best finishers they have ever done. It doesn't end there, of course, as we get one last scene with Superman telling a now-dead Goku that he actually found their fight pretty fun. The two of them agree to go again as they fist bump while looking at the rivalry spanning across every reality with a ton of cool artwork of alternate versions of the matchup, all with this beautiful piano music playing over it to give the impression that, when all is said and done, these two would just end up being really good friends. I don't think this ending could have been executed any better. And I like the conclusion. It definitely doesn't have that same wow factor that the first two had in their conclusions. Back then there was some novelty to planet busting and infinity respectively. Now it's just, oh, 75 Gargalian times universal? Put them with the rest. Can't fault Death Battle for that though. They still go very in depth, breaking down each character's advantages category by category. They even end discussing what this debate represents, which I don't know if the who wants Goku to lose sentiment landed that well for me, but the following bit where they say to not take it too seriously because it's just another fun way to appreciate these characters is a sentiment that I can absolutely get behind. And after the ending pun, instead of the winner is Superman, we close out on our host bickering as Superman smiles down on them. The episode's third perfect ending. I already knew this was going to be my longest segment in the ranking, and yet it still ended up running over what I was expecting. There's just so much to praise about Goku vs Superman. It's an instant classic that I expect I'll be going back to on a regular basis even years from now. Is it one of my own personal favourites? Not quite, no. But it's not at all hard to see why it is for so many other people, Ben included. It's simultaneously an episode where I prefer its predecessor, and think it's a perfect reflection of how far the show has come in the 10 years between them. There's no better word to describe it than super. But we do this sort of thing every day. Okay, now we're getting into some of my all-time favourite episodes. Guts vs Dimitri has only gotten better for me over time, managing to have some highlights of the season with very little holding it back. To get those out of the way, I still wish they withheld the gut strength couch to the conclusion to make the outcome less predictable. Starting in media res is a little disappointing, even if it's nowhere near as bad as the instances of it in season 6. I don't love a few of Dimitri's lines in the fight, the headbutt is the one thing I can think of that Guts vs Nightmare did better, and uh, no that's about it, nothing all that major. The analysis is fantastic, treating the heavy subject matter of Berserk with the right amount of severity and dialing back the jokes, though I could have done without the really bad things line, and managing to give an interesting coverage of both characters' tragic lives, with some fantastic editing and solid jokes, mostly in Dimitri's analysis with an especially great cutaway. The fight knocks it out of the park in every way I could want. The combat is fast and exciting with a lot of creative uses of their various weapons and powers, like having Dimitri impale 
tail guts with ice to keep him in place, but Guts blows both of them up to get himself out of the bind. Their main melee weapons are naturally what get focused on the most since it's what they're most adept with, but every other important part of their arsenals I'd want to see is used here. Each attack also has incredible sound design to sell the impact of it, with some highlights being Dimitri getting clubbed in the face in the following back shot. Guts also gets far more chances to truck through grievous injuries than he did against Nightmare, and only succumbing to the Berserker rage once he almost takes himself out. The Berserker armor doesn't have to take anything worse than this after he activates it, but I think letting him recover from all this from the get-go is enough. The scene where they both succumb to their madness is visually super cool and voiced to perfection, one of the best he just like me for real moments the show has ever done. And the following rushdown, while short-lived, is super fast and intense. It drops a bit of that momentum after the blood splatters, but nowhere near to the extent I remembered. And the critical hit is a solid final blow to set up for the fake out that Gut survived, and the following fake out of no, he actually didn't. The ending is just as strong as I remember. Not quite my favourite emotional ending of the show, but still a masterful way to close out, showing Guts the respect he deserves as he dies standing as the last drops of his blood pour out from him, holding his own until the very last second with his self control regained from his inner demons. Then having Dimitri go off to defend his soul now that he understands and respect him. He finally understood what drove his slaughter. The music is perfect for this moment too. God's hand fit the high energy action super well previously, and now gets the change to a more somber tone to fit this ending. And even if they aren't played in the episode itself, the lyrics here are among my favourites in any death battle track. The conclusion is great as well, getting across the stat gap as well as some specific counters Dimitri had which got to be shown off in the animation, very cool. This episode is a standout in every sense of the word. There's hardly ever a dull moment in the analysis or the fight, with so many scenes highlights that got me so invested in these characters that I have no first-hand experience with. It's no surprise that this ranked among the fan favourite episodes in the cast tier list. It was completely earned. Ultimately though, when it's all said and done, there can only be like four because there's still a quarter of the season left to go over. What the peak? Vader? No! Given how Liam has written my favourite episode of every season where he's done more than just his debut, I guess that means The People's Champion is my favourite to be written by anyone else. And in this case, that's Darth Vader vs Obito Uchiha. I've seen so many detractors from this episode since its release, putting it near the bottom of their rankings. But much like last year's number 4, I'm sticking with calling this one of my favourite episodes of Death Battle. The analyses are pretty much as close to perfect as I could want. Sure, Vader's doesn't touch on the advantages his suit provides or too many of his force powers, and definitely had time to since Obito got a noticeably longer rundown, but other than that, I have no complaints. Anakin got the exact kind of coverage I wanted for him, seamlessly switching between story and versus applicable stuff, while Obito managed to rebuttal my less than zero interest with my new favourite Naruto rundown on the show, actually managing to get me to care about this guy and thinking his story sounds pretty interesting. The editing and music choices are on point. Shout out to DJ getting something of this quality done despite taking a week off during production, and the stats are presented in a way that makes it seems super close and like it could go either way, aiding the fight and building more tension. And what a fight this was. I could not be happier with how Vader was done in this. Unlike Yoda and Obi-Wan who got to jump and flip around a lot more, his cumbersome armour means that he's moving around way less and much slower, which I think is very fitting for him. It lets him come across as much more intimidating as he marches towards Obito, not flinching at anything he sends his way at first. And Obito gets to fly around and use a lot more techniques to make up for the power disadvantage he's currently at, only putting them on even even footing when he absorbs the ten tails. The combat has plenty of cool standouts like this awesome rotating shot and Vader condensing the tailed beast bomb in the only time that he uses both hands in the fight, but also a ton of cool bits of underspoken strategy, like Vader using this dust cloud to disguise his surprise attack, or Obito distracting him with the Padme illusion to try and leave him open to being sucked into the Kamui dimension. Everything just feels so well thought out and naturally flowing, while managing to stay consistently engaging from beginning to end. There are so many other things to love about this episode from big aspects to smaller details like how Obito is still doing his Madara impersonation voice until his mask comes off, and then changes it again for Jubito, which Nicholas Andrew Louis does great for all three, or how Vader's lightsaber is the deadliest the weapon has felt across any death battle to feature one with how effectively it blocks and tears through everything. And while I'm mentioning voice acting, I love Jason Marnoka's commanding presence in the role, or how the track is super dramatic and melancholic, fitting these characters and the tone of the fight while having one of the greatest track names of all time, and the less flashy visuals aiding that tone. 
or how the characters take battle damage, showing the progression of the fight while allowing Obito to see a reflection of himself in Vader, or how Vader's breathing sound is stopped whenever he's speaking, or how effectively Vader's body language conveys his emotions in every scene, even when you can't see his face. This episode has so many amazing aspects that I wish I had all the time in the world to gush over. I guess this is what happens when I skip some standalone reviews. We'd better get to the ending though and start wrapping things up. After Vader bombards Obito with a surprise Chekhov's TIE fighter, his hatred and anger have him prolonged the kill just long enough to where the god tree has time to blow him and put him in the infinite Sukuyomi. Anakin is turned back into the man he used to be, with his wife standing right before him. And while we don't see it on screen, the time dilation of the technique means that Vader got to live a happy life for a few months before Obito put his physical body out of its misery. It's such a perfect way to close things out. While Vader can resist illusions or whatever, I love the narrative of him succumbing to temptation bringing him back to his life as Anakin, mirroring how temptation was what made him into Vader in the first place. I see people saying it would have been better if the Vader and Anakin sides of his personality clashed here and he gave more resistance, which would have warranted Obito finishing him off more. And that would have been a fantastic closer as well, but not in a way I think would have been inherently better or worse. Yes, it would justify Obito's pity kill more, but it would also take away the peaceful end that Anakin gets. So really, it's down to whichever one you prefer. And the conclusion's solid. Stats being close, but Obito winning with his abilities was pretty interesting to hear about. This episode is outstanding on all fronts, only really fumbling with a few ugly models distracting a little bit from important scenes, and some visual inconsistencies so minor that they're not even worth vocally mentioning separately. I love it so damn much. It's my favourite Naruto episode the show has done, my favourite Star Wars episode besides Yoda vs Mickey, and my favourite writer debut besides Magneto vs Tetsuo. Your script was most impressive indeed, Kian. <laughs> Go easy on me, what a sick joke. We meet! At last! Is Stitch vs Rocket Raccoon the craziest episode out there? No, other episodes of the season are much more ambitious. Well, this one is comparatively focused more on being chill and fun, but I think it does what it sets out to do very well. The analyses are great. I still have my issues with the editing not always matching the footage with what's being said, and the excessive music cuts really got on my nerves after a point. Some jokes definitely fell flat to me too, but I think the character coverage was interesting enough to make up for that. I loved hearing about their origins and how meeting their found families changed them as people. The verse itself was handled in a way that did didn't make the winner super obvious. The bulk of the jokes landed well enough for me, and the cutaway gags especially are highlights of the episode. Rockets was great with the parks and rack hat, but Stitches in particular really stands out to me, sounding like the exact kind of thing my friends and I would come up with in a Discord hypothetical. All that's missing is the part where Wiz and Boomstick become gay lover- I mean a line where Boomstick reluctantly says he's only coming back to talk about Stitch's weaponry. The fight as well I do still have some problems with. Namely, I wish Stitch didn't directly tank an attack from the Thanos Buster and get outsmarted when neither of those things happened was kind of crucial to their argument for him winning, and there are a few slow parts in this one shot where Rocket is aiming god knows where, but you know what, I don't really care all that much. The rest of this is so fun. I love the dynamic of Rocket actively setting up traps and trying to play things smart, while Stitch is able to tank just about everything and brute force his way to victory like the gremlin he is, using his smarts in more scrappy and creative ways whenever he needs to. Jailhouse Rocket fits both characters perfectly as a song, and underscores the fun vibe of the battle equally so. Space Hawaii is an inspired set piece, Jeff Shine and Del and Angle Sorrel gives some great vocal performances for the funny lines throughout the battle. The sprite work is on point, with Stitch especially being a highlight of the show for how expressively and smoothly he moves. Rocket escalating to the Thanos Buster because Stitch said a space slur is one of the funniest jokes in the series to me. And the ending with Stitch bursting out of the water is super hype, with the fireworks being a beautiful touch and the execution of Ice Cream Guy indeed being an artful touch. The conclusion's also good, with Stitch showing up to announce himself as the winner, putting the biggest smile on my face. And only on this rewatch did I hear Boomstick freaking out about, oh god, there's a turkey as well, where's you gonna leave it here? Now, from how I've described this one, you might not think it sounds like it should be this high up. And normally I'd agree with that. I'd been more excited about the content of the last half dozen episodes or so. But this one manages to climb in the ranks more than it would have otherwise because it's the episode that holds the most personal significance to me. I've been watching Death Battle since around 2011 or 2012. And in that time I've seen the show grow and evolve, it's had an undeniable impact on my life. As much baggage as this community has associated with it, being part of it to any extent is what's led to me meeting most of my closest friends. A group where I feel like I belong, people I love like a second family. Family. So naturally, the episode that means the most to me is the one that I finally got to watch with a lot of them in person. Watching this being close to the first thing I did with them all after finally making my way out of 40 hours of airport hell was the perfect way to unwind. 
and freaking out over Stitch's comeback and the fourth wall break at the end were highlights of what was already one of the best weeks of my life. So every time I rewatch this episode, I have that association that just makes me happy in a way that no other episode can. Obviously this didn't guarantee at the top spot as evident by how I have two more episodes to cover, and it didn't guarantee that it would rank this high regardless. If I thought the episode was mid, I'd still have it near the bottom. This just happened to push an episode that I already loved up to one of my favourites of all time. With that said, it was never surpassing those top two, were you kidding? And don't get me started on Eustace and his mallet. He'd be fucking balling on Zim. Right, can you stop stalling and answer the question, what is your third favourite death battle of all time? Scooby vs. Courage. Yeah, no, that's fair. Scooby-Doo vs. Courage the Cowardly Dog is quite possibly the episode that has left me the most baffled. How do you put out an episode this good? One that excels in every category to make up one of the best overall packages the show has ever produced. On a level of quality that is only feasible to see once in a blue moon, make me like it more than episodes I've had on a near unreachable pedestal for the better part of a decade, and not have it be my favourite of the season. I love everything about this episode. The analyses are very fun all throughout, getting to focus less on story outside of their origins since these are much more episodic shows. Instead, it focuses on being funny and showing off the absurd wacky shit in both series, and it's a joy to watch. From the host baffled reactions at all the weird stuff they're subjected to, to Max and DJ providing plenty of fun visual gags on top of their already excellent editing, to smaller details like this corner box and their feet's house being replaced with what they've done for love in a Scooby snack. There's no shortage of fun humour to make this such an entertaining watch. I don't even mind the cutaways. Courage's is admittedly pretty nothing, but the predictable punchline of Scooby's is made up for with how Ben delivers the I'm sorry ma'am at the end. And despite what I said about the story not being as important for these two, I still like that they cover their origins, relations to the most important people in their lives, and use their canon crossover as a way to close off Courage's rundown while tying both of them together in a very satisfying way. And like, how much do I really need to say about the fight? You have eyes, right? Figure it out. This is Luis's magnum opus as far as I'm concerned. I love his hand-on art style, and so getting our first fight entirely done in it since Jack vs. Afro was such a welcome surprise, and it's composited flawlessly onto the stunning 3D background. There are so many top-tier visual gags that make full use of how they can morph and destroy these mutt's bodies in any way they want since they'll always be fine afterwards. The expression work and goofy sound effects are on point, and I love the general dynamic these do have. They're already canonically friends, so them fleeing from Clay Eustace and trying to get the other to take care of him is the perfect way to set it up. Giving them a reason for their conflict, but still having scenes like Courage freaking out when he thinks he's killed Scooby and being relieved when he finds out he's alright. It makes it so much sweeter that neither of them have to kill the other in the end. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The animation would have already stood out as one of my favourites from its first half, with plenty of big standout moments to stick in my mind and much smaller details like how you can see Scooby preparing his disguises ahead of time, or how the Clay Eustace monster moves at a higher frame rate to make him look more unnatural and creepy, or how Courage rewords his question to computer to get around its lack of knowledge on Scooby in particular. But at that point, I just want to encourage you to go back through it yourself and pick out on all the fun small details that add to this feeling like a labour of love. Really though, it's the climax and ending that shoots this to one of my top three of all time. From the moment the Grabelski triangle reaches out of the screen and blinds was in Boomstick, I knew things were about to ramp up even more. After Scooby scrams all his aptly named snacks, I reiterate, you have eyes, right? Do I need to explain why Scooby Doo wise and looks cool as shit? All I can do is be stunned at how Scooby Dooby Doo ended up being one of the rawest lines in the show. Billy Ringmaster was already killing it in the role, and this is for sure my favourite of his deliveries. That's followed by my favourite delivery from Courage. Edward Bosco already gave one of the most accurate portrayals of any death battle combatant I've ever heard from the general sound of the voice to the mannerisms. He didn't need to go absurdly hard or anything to reach that status. And then he he did anyway. This scream is one of the best delivered in the show, if not outright THE best. Like, it is absurd to me that something actually topped Maiko Kovacs Goku and all the other various Dragon Ball screams from over the years. Bosco belts this out with so much energy and holds it for about a solid 10 seconds. God knows how much longer because they cut him off when Scooby crashes into him. And the impact is sold wonderfully as the screen briefly distorts the music, stops the giant fist dead in its tracks, travels up Scooby's body and shatters him back to normal, image unrelated by the way. What an outstanding sequence. The ending is also 
nice as Eustace gets mangled and dragged to hell as the dogs get to both live on good terms with each other. For the first time ever, I'm elated that it was a draw, and they explain the verdict very well regardless of equalised stats. I also want to mention the musical score since I hadn't already. Forever Terror Night is a banger and a half, easily top 5 of the season and likely in my top 10 of the show. I listen to it a ton. It's so catchy and high energy and fits every scene perfectly. Flawless track for a flawless episode. This really is something special, which was obvious from the top tier presentation. I can't give Luis and everyone else who helped him enough props. I don't have a single gripe with how this animation turned out. It would be one thing for it to just be one of the best looking episodes, but it also has some of the series' strongest music music, voice acting, editing, and writing which all comes together to make this so much greater than the sum of its already awe-inspiring parts. While I'm mentioning the script, yep, this was indeed another one written by Liam. He can't keep getting away with this. It wasn't enough that he started a monopoly on my favourite episode of each season from 6 onwards. Now he started his conquest for my entire top 10 list. Snake vs Sam and Tony vs Lex were untouchable at the top of my rankings for over half a decade. And now Liam has gone and written three episodes I like more than both of them in the span of less than two years. How the hell do you do that? Scooby vs Courage is a prime example of what this man can really do with a script at his best. And how far Luis has come as an animator since the season three days. On just about any other season list, this would put all of the competition to shame. The only seasons where it wouldn't handily take the top spot are season eight because favourite fictional character handled perfectly go burr. And, well, this one. Which leads us nicely into... Come here, you skate! Fuck. The top spot on this list was a foregone conclusion. Bill Cipher vs Discord is my single favourite episode of Death Battle. It doesn't feel real how well it all turned out. Taking every single category up to the next level with absolutely no drawback significant enough for me to bring up. The analyses here are perfect. I love the story coverage showing how they differ with one being redeemed via friendship and the other being a menace that we can only hope is gone for good. All while striking a great balance between that and their powers and feats. And they boast not just some of my favourite cutaways, but the single best edit across the entirety of Death Battle. This one feels like it has even more standout motion graphics and edits to the footage than normal, even when they weren't needed. DJ was just that committed to making this look as good as possible. And it's set apart even more by how the background assets and character renders at the start were altered, as if the characters themselves are breaking the fourth wall to play around with the analysis. All as they have some really funny interactions of their own in the sidebar text. It's on an entire level above any other episode in that regard, I can't sing its praises enough. And what else can I say about the fight that I haven't already? While Galacticron is definitely the most impressive episode in terms of how it's rendered, this remains my favourite looking fight because of how well it blends together multiple animation styles with the sprites and hand-drawn elements, which they switch between seamlessly by the way, on the 3D back Backgrounds. The sprites are Origin's best work to date, with such wide ranges of expressions and seamless rigging work for practically every shot. The sheer quantity of hand-drawn stuff is absurd for how good it all looks, especially towards the end in the Mindscape battle. I've said before, but I legit thought some of these shots were 3D models until Morrow showed otherwise. Speaking of 3D, I love how these backgrounds look and how the characters get to interact with them, with Bill building his throne of horses, Discord weaving through the tapestries, and the reversal of gravity causing the waterfalls to fall upwards. I love all these desserts and board game pieces that worked in too. And all the cameos floating around in the background, primarily of community members and their OCs, helps this feel like a love letter to said community, which is fitting for the matchup that they voted to happen on the champion's ballot. This fight's already strong visual identity is bolstered even further with the Weirdness Bubble segment giving us three additional animation styles with the claymation, rubber hose, and puppets. That last one might not technically be animation, but shut up, you get what I mean. Much like with Saitama vs Popeye, that gives it that extra special element to stand out from the other season finales. Except this one isn't even a season finale, despite the fact that it could absolutely pass as one. I'd say it even does that better than most episodes that are finales. The choreography is endlessly creative as well, even outside of the animation changes. There are so many wacky uses of their powers and fun visual gags that take full advantage of these two's ability to do whatever the hell they want as they distort the laws of reality around them. A favourite interaction of mine remains when they hit the action figure versions themselves against each other. That's gold. All of this is with some of my favourite vocal performances and music in this series. John Patton Oates' Bell Cipher flawlessly captures the character's cocky arrogance and boiling piss fury when needed. I really hope they get to come back for another episode sometime, they did an amazing job. Paul Guyot captures Discord's more carefree nature for the bulk of the fight before getting some legitimately venomous deliveries towards the end, like the I know how you die and your old home lines. The latter might have actually dethroned the I've been playing human speech as my favourite line in all of Death Battle. Discordant Decipher is 
probably my favorite track of the season. I don't know, it's a close race between this super and Fireborn. The edited version for the episode fits each scene perfectly, while the standalone release is just a super catchy song with great vocals that I could and have listened to over and over. And of course, the ending brings everything to a close flawlessly. The old home line beyond its chilling delivery is an amazing reveal that Discord had undone Bill's entire plan and brought him back to the Nightmare Realm while he was tunnel visioned on the fight. Having Bill get screwed over despite him winning the fight is a very fitting end for him, and gives Discord so much respect by letting him succeed in a way that's more important to him by saving his friends. He goes out laughing through the pain of his soul burning away, because although he didn't make it out alive, his friends are okay. They have the note that was set up earlier to let them know what happened, and he got one last trick over on the one that tried to hurt them. I guess you could say Bill won the battle, but Discord won, though. If a versus episode is able to have actual emotional weight behind it somehow, then I think that's a telltale sign that it's done something exceptional compared to the episode surrounding it. The conclusion is one of my favourites as well, with an in-depth argument backed up with corner box after corner box, feeling like everything that's being said is necessary with no pointless fluff attached, which is a miracle after the episode that preceded it. Some people disagree, and that's cool, you can keep it to yourself, I do not care. Like I said back in September, no other episode has blown me away this much with how well it was able to turn out. And what astounds me the most isn't even any of the content in the episode itself, it's that the rest of the season was still able to turn out as well as it did, particularly in regards to the amount of hand-on elements that the other 2D episodes were able to have. It somehow didn't all have to go into this one. The overall quality of the season still remained consistently high, and despite how I didn't think it was reasonable to have anything come close to this level for a long time, Belcord ended up not even being the only standout of this caliber in its season somehow. I could never fully get across how much I adore this episode. Throughout a year of consistently incredible quality of this show, Bill vs Discord stands atop it as the highlight of not just season 10, but all of Death Battle to me. I don't know how or even if they'll ever top it, but even if they don't, you won't find me complaining. So there's my ranking of Death Battle season 10. Here's all the arbitrary number scores, and I think it's a fun idea to see how each season stacks up compared to the previous one like I did last year, so here's that as well. Again, can't say this enough, best season of the show, there's no competition. Even the episodes I didn't care for quite as much were still very well made, they just didn't appeal much to my interests. And the best stand among the greatest achievements the show has ever put out. I want to end this off with a sincere thanks to everyone who worked on the season in any capacity. Research, writing, directing, editing, voice acting, animating, and all the other crucial roles in making episodes of Death Battle that I might not be as aware of. This show means a lot to me, being more or less the defining web show for me growing up. From stumbling across the first season back in the early 2010s when I was still in primary school, to watching the show grow alongside me up to the present day, where I'm now a college graduate who knows many of my closest friends because of this series. I could never fully describe the impact that this silly little web show has had on my life. And I'm glad I get to make these even sillier little videos rambling about how much I like it. And I had this last paragraph written about how I hope 2024 is a great year for the show. And I don't know if you could tell, but I'm kind of going off script now because I'm recording this a couple weeks after we got the news that Rooster Teeth would be closing down. And it didn't feel right to script this part out. This is just going to be an off the cuff kind of, I don't know what's going to happen to the show. I don't know if it'll continue after this year. Of course, I can remain hopeful, but ultimately, the most important part is the talent of people whose livelihoods are at risk. Whether it's death battle or not, I hope they're all able to land on their feet and continue to do creative work that they enjoy. I really do appreciate everything that they've all put into the series over the last 13 and a bit years. So if any of them happen to be watching this, then thank you for everything and I wish you the best. And thank you all for watching. Here's hoping that everything will work out.